hopefully you have your Bibles open to Matthew chapter 7. Picking up where we left off last week, verse 3. With the lesson on the judgment and the measure last week, we began a study of Matthew chapter 7, verse 3 through uh, 12. And the passage that teaches about how our relationship with others ought to be as a person who has God's righteousness and kingdom first in his or her life. Matthew 6, 33. As I mentioned last week, the section on our relationship with others contained six principles. Last week, we began with the first principle, simply being we must stop being judgmental. We must stop being judgmental. And in connection with that principle, I propose that Jesus was discouraging at least four common practices in regards to the type of judgment that he was referring to. We must avoid biased judgment. Judgment that's held on self-preference and prejudice by our own standard. We must avoid uninformed judgments. When we make judgments, when while not having all of the facts and evidence, it could cause a lot of damage and destroy relationships. We must avoid impossible judgments. And those impossible judgments are referring to the person's motive. We don't know and never can know the person's heart. Only Jesus himself can know the thoughts of the person's heart. And so we leave that part up to him. And so we must avoid impossible judgments. And then, fourthly, we must avoid harsh judgments. You must avoid harsh judgments. We then also establish the fact that Jesus is not saying that we cannot judge, period. Again, he's referring to a type of judgment that we should not make. And biased judgments, uninformed judgments, impossible judgments, and harsh judgments are all unrighteous judgments. For Jesus says in John 7, 24, do not judge according to appearance. Instead, he says, judge with righteous judgment. And what is righteous judgment? Well, again, we talked about the measure. I drew that line right there. How do we know how long that line is? Millie may say that line is six inches. Gwen may say, no, 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 you're wrong, Millie, that's seven inches. And so they start bickering back and forth. No, I'm right. No, I'm right. Well, who determines who's right? The ruler, the measure, the measuring tape. That is the standard on determining how long it is and to see who is right. Or they could be both wrong. It could be five inches. <laughs> it could be right in between five inches. So likewise... When it comes to us having a righteousness that surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, Matthew 5, 20, we are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So therefore, if we are to judge, it ought to be by God's standard. Right here. Right here. We'll see that later on in chapter 7, Jesus will say that we can know who a false teacher is by their fruits. Well, that involves having to make judgments. And how are we to judge those fruits? By our standard? No. By the standard of God. That is the measure that we ought to measure others and judge others when it comes to having to do so. Well, but here's the thing. Biased judgments, uninformed judgments, impossible judgments, harsh judgments, these are all universal faults. You probably know of someone who is guilty of every one of these. Do you not? Having asked that question, allow me to apologize. It was a trick question. The right application would be to direct the question at self and not others. I did this deliberately to introduce the second principle on getting along with others. Again, in this section of Matthew 7, verse 1 through 12 as a whole, Jesus is giving six principles 
on how we can get along with others or establishing godly relationships. Last week, as I said, we began with principle number one, and tonight I want us to look at principles two and three, and then next Sunday evening, if the Lord wills, we will look at the last three. But the second principle on getting along with others, or having godly relationships, is the principle of self-change. Looking at verses 3 through the first part of 5, Jesus says, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly. When it comes to the need for change, we generally prefer to look at others instead of self. Jesus clearly understood this problem among mankind, which is why he brought up this discussion. <clears throat> Examine yourself closely is the idea. Is it important that we judge others righteously by God's standard? Yeah, it is important, especially when sin is involved. But Jesus says before you go that route, before you even make righteous judgments, first examine yourself. Because you may need to have some self-change. You may be guilty of the same thing, and you may need to change yourself before you even try to help change change others. Try to imagine a man with a log from his eye, I believe I have it right here, there you go, <laughs> protruding from his eye as he struggles to position himself where he is able to see a speck that is in another man's eye. From this picture, you can obviously see the log swinging this way and that as those nearby have to duck to keep from being hit by the huge log. Jesus would have us know that it is ridiculous for us to act as judges when we may be in worse condition than those we are judging. The Pharisees, hearing Jesus, may be becoming very angry at his words, especially since they have set themselves up as the judges of the people. Everything about the way the Pharisees judged the people was completely wrong, especially since the Pharisees themselves were guilty of the same thing. I want you to go back, or at least maybe not go back, but uh, refresh in your memory the very end of John 8, John chapter 7, towards the beginning of John 8, about the woman caught in adultery. And there you have the Pharisees and the scribes and all of them picking up stones, and about the stone, the woman caught in adultery. What does Jesus say? He who is without sin cast the first stone. No one did. And Jesus looks at her and says, Your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. How often do we become like the Pharisees in that regard? How easy it is for us to see the faults of others while ignoring our own. A biblical example of this that we're all very familiar with. Think about the scenario of King David in 2 Samuel. He committed adultery with Bathsheba and then had Bathsheba's husband killed, chapter 11, verse 1 through 7. When Nathan, the prophet, God's prophet at the time, went to David and confronted him about it, he gave him the tale of the rich man who killed the poor man's lamb. David said that he wanted to hang that offender. Chapter 12, verse 1 through 6. However, when Nathan said, you are the man, instead of a hanging, David was ready for a prayer meeting. 
chapter 12, verse 13, and Psalm chapter 51 and 32. In regard to getting along with others, and what our relationships with others ought to look like, Jesus wants us to first examine ourselves to see what changes we need to make. The Greek word that's used here, in verse 3, he says, Why do you see? That Greek word means to scrutinize and examine closely. A speck is not easy to see, is it? No, not really. <laughs> when someone tells you, I have a speck in my eye, you probably cannot see it unless the light is at a perfect angle and you get very close in order to see. We could therefore add this far too prevalent characteristic to the list of bad judgmental habits. Looking for the worst in people instead of the best. Painstakingly scrutinizing every word and action in an attempt to find some fault to criticize while knowing you yourself is just as guilty. This is why the scribes and Pharisees were treating other Jews. That is how they were treating their own people. Furthermore, it is interesting that the words both speck and log are made of the same composition. Speck means a wood chip, a, um, a wood chip particle or sawdust. And the word log means a plank of wood. A speck was very small in size. A log is very large in size, but both are made of the same composition, wood. Why is that significant? Well, the possibility that the speck and the log were made of the same material provokes some very interesting and powerful thoughts. It is a fact that in human nature, we often are overly sensitive regarding faults in others that we have in our own lives. Psychologists call this projection. Projecting into the lives of others what we see in our own lives. We assume that everyone else is like us. That others think and feel the same way that we do. It is also a fact that our own sins generally do not look as bad to us as the same sins do in others. For a biblical example of this, read the account of Judah and his daughter Tamar in Genesis chapter 38. When Judah was told that Tamar had played the harlot and was with child, he was ready to have her killed. But when Tamar proved that Judah was the father of her child, the subject of capital punishment was quickly dropped. If Christ deliberately illustrated his point with two items both made of wood, we have the absurd situation of a man with a log-sized sin acting superior to another who has a speck-sized amount of sin which is the same sin. Paul wrote about this kind of inconsistency in Romans chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. I'll go ahead and jump over there and read it for us. Romans chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Interestingly, Jesus echoes the same words of Paul. How did Jesus characterize those who acted in such a way? Well, look at the first part of verse 5. You hypocrite. 
Being hypercritical makes us hypocritical. <coughs> if we constantly criticize others, we are implying that our record is clear, that our lives are right. Otherwise, we would not be qualified to judge. At the same time, we have this huge telephone pole-sized stick sticking out of our eye sockets. And so, what is the lesson for us? Oops. Oh, I guess I didn't have it on here. Start with self. The lesson here for us is start with self. Jesus said, first, take the log out of your own eyes. It is easy to confess the sins of others. It is difficult to confess our own sins. Paul advocated self-examination in a variety of texts. He says, test yourselves. Examine yourselves, 2 Corinthians 13.5. Let us stop turning critical eyes on one another. If we must be critical, let us be critical of our own conduct and see that we do nothing to make a brother stumble or fall. Romans chapter 14, verse 13. Even in the matter of self-examination, common sense is also in order. If we start with self, we will be less disposed of being judgmental. We must strive to remove all log sins from our lives. But in context, it is the log sin of being judgmental unrighteously that needs to be removed. After doing this, we are then ready for principle three. Roman numeral tris. Sensitive correction. very end of verse 5, Jesus says, And then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. After Jesus charged each one first to take the log out of his or her own eye, he said, We then are able to help others remove their sin. Oh, thought I have it on there. We are then ready to help others remove sin. Jesus said our first priority is to work on our own sins, but he did not discourage helping a brother with his sins since our own lives are in order. Once our own lives are in order. If we really love someone and see sin in his or her life, we will try to help him or her remove that sin. True love cannot ignore sin in the life of a loved one. Sin that can damn that loved one's soul into eternal hell. That's why I always get my gears all grind, grind it up. Whenever I hear people say, oh man, if you really love that person, I mean, then you just wouldn't be, you know, so in their business. Well, if it involves sin, then it is my business. <laughs> and if it involves love, <laughs> then I wouldn't be here correcting that person if I didn't love him or her. Agape love is seeking the best entrance of another. And if you really love that person, once your own life is in order, then the right thing to do is to save that loved one from eternal damnation. Now again, as we talked about this morning, they will have to come down to the fact of making a choice. It boils down between two choices. God or your balls, heaven or hell. Those are the two choices. But our duty in regards to getting along with others and having godly relationships with others, it involves helping them to remove sin. 
helping them to remove their sin after we have our lives in order. A number of passages teach on the need to help one another remove sin from our hearts and lives. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, and James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. Jesus' illustration of the speck in the eye underlines the need for help. The eyeballs and eyelids are extremely sensitive. Even a small speck in the eye is no laughing matter. I'm sure one of your grandkids have probably ran up to you screaming bloody murder, saying, I got something in my eye, Grandma, Grandpa, I need you to get it out. The speck in the eye calls a need for help. You want to just sit there as a grandmother or a grandfather, hearing your grandson or granddaughter just sit there and scream bloody murder. No, I mean, you, I mean, <laughs> tuition will kick in and you just want to jump right on it and help them remove that little speck or wash it out with water or whatever it is to help comfort them. Well, that's the whole point of what Jesus is saying here. Is that the eyeball is very sensitive. Even a small speck can do major damage. And so it calls for what? The need to help. But it also calls another thing. To have a spirit of gentleness. The illustration also indicates the approach that should be taken by the one helping. If I have something in my eye, if it's a speck, and you volunteer to help get it out, I want you to be very careful and sympathetic. <laughs> if you're not going to be, then I'll find somebody else who will. In the same way, we need to be sensitive in dealing with others. Going back to Galatians 6, 1 and 2, what does Paul say when it comes to restoring a brother or sister? How are we to approach them? Spirit of gentleness. Spirit of gentleness. We are all sinners in the presence of a holy God before whom we shall all someday stand before in judgment. We all need help spiritually. So let us be willing to help others. But as we do, let us render that help with care and compassion. I know a lot of people tend to get the word rebuke confused. I've heard many a preacher say that rebuke involves having to be harsh. No, it doesn't. Not in the Greek definitions of rebuke. Rebuke simply means strong, bold confrontation. Can we do that while being gentle at the same time? Yeah. Sometimes there's a need for us to be very straightforward with that person. Straightforward and blunt. And again, blunt doesn't mean being harsh and rude and coming across as disrespectful and mean. No. Blunt simply means you're just getting to the point. And we can get to the point by being gentle, can we not? So again, rebuke is simply just a straightforward, strong confrontation. It doesn't mean that you have to be harsh and start calling that person stupid and get their head on straight and that they ought to be ashamed of themselves, yada, yada, yada. No. What are we trying to do? We're trying to help them get the sin out of their life. And we ought to do that with the spirit of compassion and care. Folks, our lesson opened with the idea that we must first be concerned about the need to change ourselves in our own lives. It is time for self-examination. If your life is crying out for important changes and we can help you, please let us know together as we stand and as we sing. Have you been to Jesus for the 